she'll hate me describing it like this, but I'm going to interview, I think, someone you could call a national institution. It's Shami Chakrabarti. Uh, she used to be uh, director of Liberty, the uh, civil rights organisation. Uh, she stood down, uh, but she's been this huge presence in politics uh, over the last few years. Civil liberties is often uh, not the most popular of issues, so you need a bit of courage uh, to be able to, to stand your ground. And she's certainly done that, but I want to know what makes her tick. Where do her values come from? And what does she think about the big issues of today? Shall we chat with Marty? As I live and breathe. Uh, the former director of Liberty. Yes, I can't believe Owen. I'm saying this. Yes, Owen. It's emotional. emotional. Everyone I'm... has to leave home one day. I know, I tell myself that every day. But, uh... <laughs> but your mum won't let you. No, I know. You know, well, you know, maybe when I'm a teenager. If I could invent a time machine and we went back to 2003 when you became course, Director of Liberty. What would you say to yourself? I mean, do you think you had any idea of what you were getting no. yourself into? No, I, I did not anticipate the scale of the challenge, but also the scale of the opportunity. Mm. You know, for everybody that's disappointed, there have been other people that have come up trumps. And that is the great thing, not just about um, politics and activism, but also about life, I think. I certainly would do it again. Mm -hmm. If I were to say anything, I'd say, you know, be strong, don't worry about the, you know, the slings and arrows, particularly now with social media. And you have to be an optimist to do the kind of work that we do, to actually ask people to be their better selves and to, and to get them to go with the hope and not just always choose the sort of fearful, pessimistic um, path. Of course, you grew up in London. Your parents were originally from Bengali, yeah, they, so, so my parents came from Calcutta and they came to London in the late 1950s and uh, at a time when migrants were more welcome. They were encouraged by Harold Macmillan to come to the UK and boost the economy by doing jobs that other people didn't want to do. A conservative government, no less. A conservative government. A decade later, I, I came along, but they lived in, in a London that uh, was already becoming a wonderful cultural mix. There was also quite a sinister style too in the 70s, wasn't there? I remember seeing National Front graffiti on walls and as I walked down the street with my parents and hoping that they couldn't see it. I don't remember this, but when I was a baby in the pram, um, my parents were attacked by skinheads wow. on Hampstead Heath, which mm. is now thought of as a very sort of genteel mm. part of town, but it wasn't wasn't always that way. And that, you know, entered the family folklore, you know, uh, my dad getting really quite badly beaten up. Is it fair to say your dad had a particular influence on the sort of values you ended up having? My dad's a funny fish because he um, is not necessarily a bleeding heart liberal by, by, by any um, stretch, but there was a moment when I was probably about 12 or 13 years old. The hunt was on for the Yorkshire Ripper. And I can remember watching this story every night on the news. And I said something about what should be done to this monster. And my dad sort of turned to me, and he's not normally a quietly spoken man, but on this occasion he just sort of very quietly um, and calmly said, you can't possibly support the death penalty. And the truth is, I didn't know. Mm. And my dad said to me, um, you've got to remember that no criminal justice system in the world in history, all that you could design in the future would ever be 100% perfect. Mm. And even if you're only the one person in a hundred, a thousand, a million that, that's wrongly convicted, how do you think that would feel? Mm. What would it feel like to be taking your final steps after every appeal has been exhausted, nobody believes you, and then he said, I'll never forget this, he said, even your own family don't believe you. That was particularly chilling mm. as a 12, 13 year old girl. And your own family don't believe you and you're about to go to the lethal injection, the electric chair, the gallows, and you say to yourself, I haven't done this, but they're going to kill me. And, you know, there are all sorts of arguments against the death penalty, not just the miscarriage of, mm. of justice argument, but that just hit me. It was the moment. Civil liberties yeah. is often a very unpopular cause. The thing about human rights is, you know, people can deride them, but everybody loves their human rights and their civil liberties. They love their own. It's just other people's they've got a problem with. Mm. And the same people, including politicians, by the way, who would um, dismiss us as 
you know, BMW driving, legal aid lawyers, and you know, all the, all the attacks. Goodness me, when they get hauled up for their expenses, or they feel that they're being treated unfairly, they're the first to, you know, to pick up the phone. And in the end, um, the people who always s suffer the most from an authoritarian attack on rights and freedoms are the most vulnerable. Mm. The trick to human rights is caring about other people's kids in the way that you care about your own. The Human Rights Act is portrayed yeah. by its opponents as a charter for terrorists and criminals. The government say we'll introduce, uh, we'll scrap it, have a British Bill of Rights. What's the problem with that? We have a choice. The protection of being a human being everywhere or the protection of being a citizen in one tiny corner of the planet. The Human Rights Act has been embedded for long enough now, and I've been doing this work for long enough to be able to point up examples of people who never thought the knock would come on the door for them. So everyone knows the story of Abu Qatada, not a human rights poster boy, pretty unpleasant man. Yes, it took a while to get rid of him, but you know, what about Gary McKinnon? What about Christopher Tappan? You've just got to be careful what you wish for, because we can, we'll all be foreigners to another government's eyes. And you can get in trouble, particularly you, with the stuff you get up to. You can get trouble what online. What a scandalous well, you, accusation. Well, you're, you're, you're frankly gobbing off all the time, saying all sorts of political things that, that frankly, would be seen as probably seditious Rightly so. in another country. We're all vulnerable if we don't seek human rights protection all over the planet. If it's just going to be British privileges for British people, that might work here. But that's not going to protect you when another government comes knocking and wants you to be extradited for something that you said or allegedly did uh, online. We've seen a number of terrorist attacks over the years. Yeah. Um, in, in London, of course, in, in Paris, and of course in, in Belgium. Those who are critical, I suppose, of the civil liberties kind of agenda, whatever you want to call it, would say to save people's lives and protect people, you have to in, kind of infringe on certain liberties. What would you say to those people? I'd say, how's that working out for you? Whether it's the military ones over there mm. or the clamping down on civil liberties over here, have they really made us safer? Can we really say that now with hindsight? When we look at the rise of, of ISIS, can we really say that that um, terrifying movement hasn't in part gained from um, our mistakes, our propaganda coups that we've handed them. If, if this is an ideological struggle, as so many people say it is, what's our ideology? Mm. Seems to me that the only thing we've got as, as Democrats all over the globe is the ideology of human rights. It's the only universal language probably other than barbarism and war. And I don't see that we succeed in this ongoing struggle by, um, by undermining the philosophy that we ought to be that we ought to be promoting, whether it's as a parent of a teenage child, or whether it's a, a, of a government, once you are too readily charged with hypocrisy, it's very very hard to get to get hearts and minds back. And, and we need a united society, and we need a united democratic world to deal with this challenge, which is truly internationalist. We have to be truly internationalist in response. Do you worry about a relationship with the likes, for example, of Saudi Arabia? I do. Do you think that's had a role, basically? Of course, of course we're just being hypocritical about, you know, about the Saudi Arabia thing. We have to talk about this mm. more openly. Credit to um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's actually started talking about things like that. And there's been too much glossing over um, the, the disjuncture between home policy and foreign policy and um, human rights policy and aid and trade policy. You know, these things have to be, have to finally be talked about. New Labour and civil liberties, because that's when you really came to this huge prominence. How would you sum up that record, that the Blair Brown years on? There was a contradiction at the heart of New Labour thinking. On the one hand, all sorts of progressive things were done to the apparatus of the law, devolution, freedom of information, race relations amendment act, um, gay equality legislation, and of course, the jewel in the crown for me, the human rights act. But on the other hand, the values enshrined in those instruments often undermined in thought and word and deed. It wasn't just New Labour, we were in a very, very bipartisan, authoritarian age in British politics. And I think it probably began earlier with 
with Michael Howard and Tony Blair, and it was who you know the arms race, who can be nastier to refugees and asylum seekers, you know, to naughty kids on council estates, you know, it's, it's all about divide and rule, you know, let's separate the worthy from the unworthy. It's a mistake, it's dangerous politics, and it's a kind of orthodoxy from, from which we've yet quite to, to recover in this country, but, but I, I think there's hope. Did Blair and Brown ever try and woo you in any way? Yes, yeah, sometimes people will try to, to woo you, um, and that would be very flattering if the deal was we're going we're gonna to change our policy, but it's not flattering if at times there's a suggestion that you, know, you would take various um, honours or, or jobs or whatever it is in exchange for um, your silence over things that, that you really is care that about. Happened? You know, I, let's you know, kiss and tell is is a tawdry thing, and, and not kissing and telling is probably pretty tawdry as well. But it wasn't just a, it, it wasn't just New Labour. There've been other parties at various times that, that have been quite you know um, keen to you know to put a little. You truth. Tell me the details, will you? I can tell. I think it's quite important if you put yourself in this position of um, being a campaigner and doing it in a cross-party, non-party way over a number of years, and you have had. Um, the privilege of audiences with, you know, with these very powerful people. Um, there's no need to. There's no need to breach no that need trust. That the refugee crisis, as you said, your yourself, your, your family are migrants. Does that make make it a bit more visceral for you? Yes, I, you know, I, I think we should all care as human beings. Yeah. We should all care about the refugee crisis. But you know, once more, when the leader of the opposition was castigated by our prime minister for visiting a quote bunch of migrants i found that really hard to take because i'm descended from migrants not a bunch it only takes two mm. but i found that frankly personally insulting my old dad would be the first to tell you that um that he he thinks that he's probably less entitled to be in the uk he was he was a migrant who had a choice he was welcome but he was an economic migrant he he wasn't a desperate refugee all these words that we now use to avoid the word refugee. You know, first it was um, asylum seeker, then the word bogus got added, yeah. and now we use the word migrant. We, we won't use that noble word that we once used, which was refugee. These are really, really desperate people. And whatever the answer, and I think Britain and Europe should do more, of course I do, but whatever your views on that, to call these people a bunch of migrants was frankly an in insult to our humanity. Do you think the British government's, how, how would you judge its response to the refugee crisis generally there? I the think that our government's response um, has been woefully inadequate in every sense, in thought and word and deed. Language is a good place to begin, it, not to end, but it's a really good place to begin. We now have the code which is, oh, we're going to send the gunboats out to deter the people smugglers. No, you're going to send the gunboats out to stop desperate people getting to our shores. That dishonours the Holocaust, that dis dishonours the Refugee Convention, which was probably the world's apology for the, for, for, for the Holocaust. So the language is bad enough, you know, um, the language of swarming and flooding mm. and all this dehumanising language. I mean, that's worthy of Rwanda during the massacre. Cockroaches and all, Cock all of that. So that's, that's really bad. And then the actual policy um, is, it, it, it is terrifying. Do you have hope? that things can be different? I think I have more hope today than I had when I walked into Liberty's offices the day before 2001. I feel we're less complacent about human rights. We care more about human rights. We have more access to the levers of communication and power via things like the internet. I just think it's time for our, our, our political representatives to catch up, but I think we can make them catch up. and. Um, Frankly, Owen, every time I talk to you, I feel more optimistic. Point back at you. So, um, at you. no, it's all, it's, it's all to play for, as they, as they say. I, I, think, um, I think there are better times ahead. I don't think you get a more eloquent defence of civil liberties than that. Uh, I mean, it's obviously a huge loss, the liberty that she's gone. It'll be fascinating to see what she decides to do now. Uh, but, you know, those causes, they don't go away. And she's been a very inspirational figure. Uh, but I suppose it's for others to, to carry that torch of civil liberties uh, in the coming years. We've got loads of interviews to come. Uh, so subscribe, leave your comments, want to know what you think. And I'll see you next time.